Chefs Without Restaurants, episode 82 with Lisa Donovan. I was really excited about having a career in baking and in pastry because it was something I was really passionate about. And I'm also a strategist and a pragmatist. And I I saw very clearly from the beginning that food would not get in the way of me wanting to be a writer. Um, there were a lot of career paths that were going to take me from writing that I could have, you know, arts administration. There were a lot of things that I just knew right away were going to take something from me and not really line me up to write the way I always felt like I wanted to be able to write. So the, the book was not just a, a, it's in the moment, this is going to happen. My whole adult life was putting pieces together to be able to write books and to be able to write at one point, hopefully as a career. That was intentional. I, did I think it was going to be a book of this kind of personal magnitude? Absolutely not. Did I think I would always write from a very personal place? Yes. This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I'm your host, Chris Spear. On the show, I have conversations with culinary entrepreneurs and people in the food and beverage industry who took a different route. They're caterers, research chefs, personal chefs, cookbook authors, food truckers, farmers, cottage bakers, and all sorts of culinary renegades. I myself fall into the personal chef category as I started my own personal chef business, Perfect Little Bites, 10 years ago. And while I started working in kitchens in the early 90s, I've literally never worked in a restaurant unless you count Burger King. Before we get to today's episode, I wanted to let everyone know that I recently launched a Patreon, so now you can support the show and the Chefs Without Restaurants organization. You can find the link in the show notes or at patreon.com forward slash chefs without restaurants. I think there's some great rewards with more to come. If you have a minute, please check out the video that I uploaded to the site. It'll answer a lot of your questions. I really want to continue with this podcast, and this would help me continue to bring you awesome conversations every week. And I'd like to take this time to thank my first two supporters, Chefs Justin Kana and Matt Collins. Justin and I recorded an episode a few months ago, which I broke into two episodes, actually. And then I sat down with Matt not too long ago, and his episode should be coming out next month. So thanks, guys, for the support. So on this week's show, I speak with Lisa Donovan. She's a pastry chef and James Beard award-winning writer. She's helmed the pastry kitchens of some of the most important restaurants in the country, including Husk in Nashville, and has kept her whole life afloat by making, writing on, and thinking about food, including consulting, recipe development, selling pies out of the trunk of her car, and creating the now-retired Buttermilk Road Sunday Suppers. While Lisa is a pastry chef, this isn't really a discussion about kitchens, though we do touch on that. She writes full-time now, and her first book, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger, was released in August 2020. Most of our discussion revolves around the process of and decision to write her memoir and everything that came along with that. We discuss the current state of the restaurant industry, getting comfortable with your audience even when it's not who you expected it to be, and I get to talk to her about chess pie. I recommend you check out her book because it's such a great read, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. So thank you all for listening, and have a great week. Hey, Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you and hear so much about your story. I did read your book, but uh, you know, maybe we'll find some gems that weren't in there. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> there, uh, there was plenty that didn't make the cut. So <laughs> I can't imagine how much work it is writing a book. Like I don't, I don't know. I like the longest thing I write are blogs that are you know a couple hundred words, but. Uh, It's a good exercise in uh, perseverance, which is never a a, a bad thing to have to sort of face yourself with. And it also, I think, if you, you know, if you feel a commitment to writing, it's a really good opportunity to to dig deeper than 3,000 to 5,000 words will typically let you, you know, and uh, to also get messier. You know, I, I think I struggle a little bit with perfectionism 
Uh, and I am in no way, shape or form there yet with writing. And so there was a lot of these moments, you know, as a pastry chef, I, I, I had time and privacy in my kitchen to test things and to really, you know, lean on technical prowess to sort of make things what I wanted. And with writing, you have to allow a, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of personal messiness that I, am not necessarily inclined to on a normal day-to-day -day basis. I, I, uh, I don't think I'm like an emotionally controlled person. That's not what I mean, but I think I try to keep myself squared away and in certain boxes, um, and the writing doesn't allow that. So in that way, yeah, it's hard in that way, especially memoir writing. I am looking forward to doing some work that is a little less, you know, emotional spelunking. <laughs> so... Yeah, the podcast was the same for me. You know, I'm someone who was pretty reserved, like, and I just found that the more I've gotten into it, the more I feel comfortable sharing my story, you know, nothing super traumatic. But, you know, I've had some really not great work experiences. And for so long, you know, you're taught like, well, you don't talk about that. Like, there's no way you'd go out and talk about your former employer. What if you need a job? And, you know, just like, and holding that in, it's like, well, someone's going to benefit from hearing my story. You know, I was having anxiety attacks and physical ail ailments like related to stress that was all work induced. But for so long, I felt like I can't I can't say that. Like, I can't talk about where I worked. I can't tell anyone this. And now it's like I have nothing to lose from that. Like, I'm never looking to go back and work a corporate job again. And I'm just like not being true to myself by not telling these stories. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, you and I were just. Um talking about being of a certain generation. And I, I think for me, you know, I struggled with jumping headlong into those kinds of narratives because I never wanted to be identified with struggle, you know, with my own struggles. And my, I, my husband will tell you, you know, I'm an insufferable isolationist when it comes to my problems. I really, I really don't like to talk about the things that are happening because I'm too busy trying to problem solve them in the moment that I just sort of feel like, well, what's the good of talking about it? And I'm trying to actually be effective in my work to solve the problem. And at some point I realized I was generating a, a real level of, of um, <laughs> self delusion, you know, of like, you know, you're actually not just not talking about it, you're kind of pretending that these things don't exist and trying to circumnavigate some things. And so there were these moments where I was trying to preserve the work and the station I had. Sure, we all want to sort of, you know, protect the hard work we've done. But at some point, I also realized this isn't actually serving me the way I feel like it is. I'm not toughing it out. It's getting stored somewhere. I'm I'm still thinking about it. I lay awake at night thinking about these things and the, how it could have gone or should have gone or the things that could have been better or what could I have done? And, you know, taking all of the responsibility for things that just simply, you know, were uh, untenable in my, the culture around us. And so I think that's when I started to sort of feel like, well, shit, I know I'm not the only person feeling this way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people started, the culture started to change. We started to get more comfortable talking about these things. And there became an opportunity to say some things that I felt like I don't have to carry this around and feel like I'm not performing well enough or meeting some challenge because the challenge actually is for me to uh, swallow a pretty bitter pill. And I don't think that's a challenge worth rising to. And, and then there are just, you know, career aside, there were things I did sort of want to, uh, this book for me was more about addressing things as a woman than it ever was as addressing it as a, a chef or a cook or someone that has had a career in restaurants her whole adult life. I really felt strongly about trying to have a conversation that was more about the decisions I have made and also the decisions I feel like I've had to make in the face of a lot of things. And so in that way, I really was making a conscious decision to, I don't have a problem holding people accountable, but really what I wanted to do was to find moments of reflection for myself and why I chose to make the decisions I made uh, and hold myself accountable and figure out 
why I felt the urge or the impulse or the pressure or whatever. And then to take it apart sort of from that, I'm, I'm a real big problem solver. <laughs> and I don't like to just talk about feeling shitty or shitty things. I like to figure out why and, and, and to a really exhaustive point sometimes. And so for me, that actually went more back to my upbringing. And so that's where my, my family comes in and all of these things that I had to uh, reckon with, honestly, about uh, how I was conditioned just by my upbringing that I was no longer willing to tolerate. So um, that was more important to me to sort of address. It was less about he did this to me or that person, you know, made me feel this way. It was more like, well, why was I in that position to begin with? And why did I not have the strength or the voice at, you know, 27 to, you know, outside of just youth and immaturity, there was something inside of me that was telling me that was right and I was wrong. So what is that? Where does that voice come from? And I really wanted to take that apart more than I was interested in, you know, accusing anybody of anything because you could do that all day. You know, I, I wanted to find the power to take apart the conditioning in me because then I can actually live my life going forward the way i I feel strongly about, you know, the way I know that feels right. So what was the point at which you decided, I'm going to write this book? You know, it's interesting. I, I don't, I think I, um, I had felt really comfortable with, I was really excited about having a career in baking and in pastry because it was something I was really passionate about. And I'm also a strategist and a pragmatist. And I, I saw very clearly from the beginning that food would not get in the way of me wanting to be a writer. Um, there were a lot of career paths that were going to take me from writing that I could have, you know, arts administration, um, working in, you know, there was, there were a lot of things that I just knew right away were going to take something from me and not really line me up to write the way I always felt like I wanted to be able to write. So the, the book was not just a, a, it's in the moment, this is going to happen. My whole adult life was putting pieces together to be able to write books and to be able to write at one point, hopefully as a career. That was intentional. I, did I think it was going to be a book of this kind of personal magnitude? Absolutely not. Did I think I would always write from a very personal place? Yes, that is, no matter how hard I try to rage against it, that is where my writing comes from. It comes from this very emotional place. It comes from a very um, private place. It comes from a, a very sometimes confrontational place with myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I, my goal when I'm writing is to undo something or to figure something out or to sort of state uh, an understanding that I've come to. So the book, you know, I had written the Food Mine article, which is what I won the James Beard Award for. That article was an email I wrote to a dear friend. <laughs> You know, I, I, uh, these are, I am constantly processing the world through writing and I just don't share 99% of it because it's, it, a lot of it is sort of this potential, potentially overwrought, you know, writhing of like my person, but sometimes I get so angry and need to share it with another human so that I can feel like I'm not just, you know, sitting here bathing in my own, you know, whatever, like my own emotional juices, which is, you know, it can get really murky sometimes. And I sent it to a friend who was directly associated with the situation, you know, uh, in New Orleans. And I just said, I just got to say this out loud to someone. And that's sort of how that she sent it to Kat Kinsman. And that's how that piece got published eventually. And, and so dominoes started falling a little bit. And uh, there was an opportunity, you know, I've had a literary agent for about seven years and, you know, we've worked on ideas and I made my intentions really clear to him about what I wanted my writing career to be. And so I was really pay, playing a very long game with, with my writing career of, 
you know, I, I'm raising these two young kids. I'm working in a restaurant. I'm trying to just keep my lights on. I'm trying to sort of just survive there. It wasn't actually a lot of time for professional style writing. I was writing, but there wasn't a lot of time for me to hone that career at all. Um, but I have had a good agent for nearly a decade now, and he has been really committed to my writing and my work. And, and he, I think, is sort of this he's a real linchpin for me. Like he's a real, like, um, you know, tether to what my potential is as a writer. And so he's never let me write a book that would sort of just be like a few bills to pay. And here's a one-off baking book, Lisa, you can write more than that. Like, not that there's anything wrong with a a one-off baking book, but as we were talking about earlier, I've never had a restaurant. I've never owned my own bakery. You know, so so attaching me to a place has always been hard for publishers to conceptualize. And it's a much harder obstacle as a baker pastry chef who doesn't own her own bakery to publish a book. You know, it just is. And so the things that we were trying to sort of cultivate for cookbooks just never felt right. And I started just, you know, continuing to write essays. He would see my writing frequently in my pitches and making this very long, but the the mechanics of how this book came to be were less, you know, a heat of a moment kind of thing. You know, like there was an article that came out in the Washington Post that Charlotte Druckmann wrote last year that really, um, I understood her overall point of, you know, it was, you know, a, a great many white women chefs published a bunch of memoirs last year. But it wasn't that. It wasn't like I got thrown this book deal because the publishers, you know, whatever. I've been working my whole life to be able to write books. And um, the thing that was even more sort of disappointing about that is Charlotte knows that, you know, Charlotte knows, like I used to call her when I was a pastry chef going, okay, I just am about to quit my job. How do I make sure that I can pay my bills writing? And so she like has heard me struggle for this career for, you know, very long time. So it wasn't a flash in the pan. It wasn't, you know, maybe it was the publishing world finding a moment. And if that's what she was speaking to, that's fine. But for me, this is, this is, uh, this has been everything I've been working towards. And did I think it was going to be this sort of personal, uh, treaties of my entire family? Well, hell no. Like I had no idea, but the moment was right for that. And, and, and if I, I truly believe if you're going to go down a path of trying to sort of take apart your trajectory as a woman in this world, you have to do it with uh, great honesty. And that's what happened. And I, I couldn't go into this uh, with a soft touch. It, it really became a moment and an opportunity to speak to something that I have been truly as just a human, not as a writer, digesting and taking apart and trying to process my whole life. So I can't imagine writing a book like this and exposing yourself to the world in this kind of way. It must have been, I mean, was it really challenging to kind of relive all that stuff and then also put it into words for the world to? uh... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, there's like, yes, is the whole answer to that. And, And I think you do have to sort of forget that the world is going to read it while you're doing it. Um, I really do think I closed myself off to understanding that this was going to be read by anyone. Otherwise, I don't know that it could have come out the way it needed to come out. And I guess for anyone listening who hasn't read the book, you know, it's your life story. And so much of it is rooted around food and cooking. But I mean, there's also very personal parts about, you know, sexual assault and having an abortion and all kinds of things that again, I couldn't even imagine sharing anything that personal about myself with the whole world. So I think you're super brave for having put that out there. Was there any time that you were worried about backlash, whether it be like professional from people in the industry or just like family who didn't want all this stuff coming out? Did you did you worry about that? Hindsight, I can tell you, I should have worried more. (laughs) I should have worried more. Uh, Again, I think it kind of goes back to when you are engaging in a process like that, you almost can't think about it. I tried to include my mom as much as I could, especially when I was writing about her mother 
um, because that was so much of the lineage I was trying to sort of take apart and put back together. And I felt like I was including her in what the potential of this story was going to be. Of course, like hindsight is very clear. Uh, I really wish I would have known that even though my intention, and I do think the outcome of this was basically a love letter to my mother and her mother and a reclamation of them and an honoring of them that, you know, that was the work I was doing every single day. I was sitting down and, and trying to honor the women that have made an impact in my life. And they were the two that were really important for me to be honest about, because I feel like women go through this world sort of obfuscating the complexities of each other so often. And I really wanted to get down to their nuts and bolts because, you know, we never get to do that as women. And regardless of my intentions, I think I really wish that I could have predicted how exposed she would feel. You know, there is something inside of me that actually doesn't feel, um, I do feel exposed, but I feel exposed for my people more than I feel exposed for myself. I think I'm tired of shame. You know, I think I'm so tired of shame being such a prominent feature that I, I, I kind of feel this freedom from it now that I just, you know, it's part of my evolution as a woman is to say, fuck that shame anymore. I just don't want it. And that, that, you know, is not something my mother has, you know, and I, I just wish that I could have predicted how hard that would have been for her. I will say, um, you know, we had a, a sticky couple of months, but I can tell you that we've always had a lovely relationship with bumps. You know, I think any mother and daughter, especially of my generation and her generation, we all, we seem to have similar conversations uh, as women. You know, me and my friends talk about our mothers very similarly. Uh, and I feel like my mom and her friends probably talk about their daughters very similarly. There's a very huge chasm of misunderstanding um, between that generation of women and my generation of women, huge, deep, wide, very deep and wide. And we have always played our roles to, to each other, but we've never had the depth of connectivity that I think we've had over the last couple of months since this book has come out, since we went over that mountain and together, we had to have some hard talks. And, um, so in that way, that is exactly the intention of the book was, you know, I've done a lot of book clubs and I can't tell you, um, you know, for all of the disasters that this path of, of publishing a book in 2020, what I can tell you is it has provided an opportunity to, to join in on a lot of small and larger book clubs where it's just women on a private Zoom. Um, sometimes it's six women, sometimes it's 30 women. And I don't think there has, there's maybe been one or two, but the majority of these book clubs, older women, my mother's age, have brought their daughters my age. And they are sharing this book together and they're going, and they're having conversations. That to me has been everything is, is creating a, a place where mothers and daughters and women in general are getting to have some harder conversations with each other about what these relationships are between us because they're not simple um and and i they don't they shouldn't be simple but we have to understand what they are and what they're made of how did you go about marketing the book like when you were putting it out there was it marketed towards women of a certain age mothers daughters because you know it did kind of get thrown in with like food writing books but it's not really like i think the casual chef who reads food books it's probably not necessarily for them. Right. It's it uh it was tricky for sure to be sure. I mean, Penguin Press I think did their best to sort of find the the space, you know, but it's like a chef without a restaurant. You know, there aren't a I I think I'm just perpetually going to always be in the purgatory of of branding for lack of better word. Like I um I'm and I'm pretty comfortable with that, but it does make it harder. You know, I think Penguin Press really wanted to 
you know, and, and not as a, as a fault. Like, I think they really, really rested on my career as a pastry chef and my alignment with other well-known chefs. And that was smart, but it did sort of minimize the pros, I think, and the, how much I wanted it to be in a uh, writer's space. Um, but I don't, I don't exist in that space yet, you know? So we had to really do this kind of, I think they did a beautiful job of sort of trying to find the balance. I, you know, I can't, this, uh, how they, they were the marketers. I was not, and I didn't hire an outside PR person. I um, have really felt very lucky and uh, comfortable with the way that Penguin Press has wanted to go about this. And I trust them as a publishing house. And so, you know, we, we suffered a lot of unfortunate hiccups because of what last year was. Um, but I, you know, and I promise I'm not just trying to be a Pollyanna or polish a turd. Like, I really do think that, you know, there were obvious disappointments, you know, in publishing is, is truly a bandwidth issue. You know, if, you know, Dave Chang's book, for instance, was supposed to come out in the spring and everything got pushed. And so these big names all of a sudden got sort of piled onto this moment when first time authors usually have a nice little breath to say like, oh, I'm going to be Terry Gross is calling and that. Well, then all of a sudden everything sort of gets pushed and, you know, you can't, it truly just becomes a bandwidth issue. You know, there's not enough space. And I've been so fortunate because, you know, Dave was such a huge advocate for my book and he used so much of his space to talk about my book. And that was a really beautiful thing because it wasn't even out of obligation or, you know, pity it was he really got something out of the book and um I think I, I I was such a great benefactor of other people's generosity um Penguin Press did a great job of setting me up and then these relationships that I've had and been building for several years have really came through for me and people really talked about it and that made a huge difference um in fact it's it's been the only you know this book has been primarily word of mouth. And it is starting to sort of get outside of the chef space. So I don't mind being in the chef space. I would love to continue writing about food and, um, you know, food narrative and those connectivities about, you know, where people find themselves in you know, the food culture is really important to me as a person. But I also obviously have a lot to say about our culture and women and my experience as a woman and, and sort of having some harder conversations for like, you know, I've got a 16 year old daughter and hopefully we're clearing out some of the, 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 the brush, you know, so that they can walk a little more freely. And I feel from the culinary standpoint, the book was, it made me sad and not because it, because it was so true, you know, the, it's a, a look at the restaurant industry. We're starting to tell these stories now, right? Like it's, there's been so much problematic behavior for so long, but that wasn't anything I was aware of when I got into it. You know, I got into food because I wanted to be a chef and I went to culinary school in, you know, 94 to 98. And at the time, nobody said, you're going to work in this place and your boss is probably going to be an asshole. And like, they're going to want to exploit you and they're going to want to do this and that. Like, I just wanted to cook and make good food. And I think at least now, kids maybe have a better idea of what they're getting into, but just kind of like reading. And it was just, you know, the first chunk of your book was a very quick kind of summary about like, this is what I encountered. And it seems to be the story of almost everyone, but especially women, I'm sure, in the kitchen and, and people of color. But it's just, it's not a great place to work. And I find that so sad because this is what I wanted to dedicate like my life to doing. And now, you know, I don't, I couldn't work in a professional kitchen anymore is what I, you know, I came to the realization. Same, same. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think it's always great to talk about the hope in a moment, even whenever, you know, I have so many of my friends who are struggling and it, um, I, I don't believe in toxic positivity. That's not where I'm going with this. Like there are some really hard things happening in the restaurant world with people who I do believe are doing it correctly and trying to build the best of our industry, you know, I, I fear we're going to lose a lot of those really good, solid chef owned restaurants because the world is not prepared to understand how the changes might need to happen for them to survive. 
But, you know, I was really fortunate to, um, there's a really incredible high school, culinary high school in New York that I um, was asked to speak to. And I think it's been one of the, I think most important experiences since this book came out was to talk to a bunch of 17, 18 year olds who are about to graduate from this culinary high school who have built, you know, have planned at that age. Can you imagine being at that age and then seeing the restaurant industry just fall in on itself after all of this reckoning has happened about, you know, the exploitation that already lives within it and all of the people that are taking advantage of, uh, you know, the, the investors that are really taking advantage of, um, the, the culture that pre-existed them. And so it was a really good opportunity for me to say to them that, you know, look, this is the first time, I don't want to overuse this metaphor because I've told this story before, but I think it's really true. Like this is the first time the plane has ever been grounded. You know, you guys actually, because they were very devastated. They were like, do we go get different careers? Do we, you know, is there any career to have in the restaurant industry at this point? And what I actually think is that we, the, the positive thing is we have built a culture that people want to be a part of, that they value, that they, they care about. They understand how important uh, chefs and cooks and the restaurant industry is to our, our, our world, our country, our interactions, our society. That has become something that I think we can be very proud of. I think what this moment can demand of these young kids coming up is they actually have an opportunity that neither you nor I had, which was to fix the plane while it's in the shed. You know, like we were trying to fix it while we were flying the goddamn thing and you can't get it right you know when you're trying to keep it from plummeting to the earth right and now there's this moment where we can all look at it take it apart say what has to happen what has to change can it work what what you know policy in our country needs to change for small businesses with these kinds of margins to survive you know how do we support our workers better for me Yes, of course, there's a gender and a, a race issue in, in restaurant culture that is abhorrent, but this is a workers' rights issue. This is, you know, cross-cultural, cross-gendered issue of, you know, worker exploitation. And we really have an opportunity now for, you know, every chef that I'm very good friends with that owns a restaurant is not trying to exploit their workers. They truly are looking at the numbers and trying to make it work. So what is the problem over the over their head? You know, how do we, yes, we need to address all of the systemic issues that, that exist culturally. But for me, that you know, so much of it comes from this inability for us to actually run these businesses in this country uh, with any feasibility, you know, um, and that's where the, see these rich, in, so it just becomes this thing where it's like, then these rich investors sniff that out and start to see an opportunity. So it becomes sort of this bigger picture thing for me. And I do believe in individual responsibilities when we're talking about cultural disparities and for the restaurant industry, I think we have a real opportunity right now to sort of figure out how the infrastructure can work better for the workers. And now I'm starting to see some of these things creep into the personal chef space because for so many years, being a personal chef and a caterer was like, you go out on your own. But now there's all these people in, you know, they're big money and tech and investors and they build the platforms and they come and say like, oh, well, it's so easy to be a personal chef. You don't have to worry about any of the business stuff, you know, come on my platform. And then, you know, they're taking a big cut and they're, you know, it's like you, there's the big trade off and running a business is tough, but now I see like so many of us got out of a restaurant to do our own thing. And now everyone's kind of invading this space. You know, like, I don't think ghost kitchens are a bad thing in general, but you're seeing a lot of these big companies start them where they're then, you know, bringing kind of those bad practices of restaurants into a new venue. And I'm just kind of afraid that we're just going to see this cycle where it's like, oh, well, let's now prey on these people. Yeah, well, I think that's why, you know, we do just, uh, for me, it's... I feel very lucky and privileged because the older I get, the more I find myself in a position to sort of think a little bit 
less in the, the the throes of it all and and really think about local political engagement and really figuring out how to maximize the opportunities in your community to create a, a culture that supports this, not just because your guests support it, but because your actual local civics is supporting um, this. And then of course we have to think about federal government and federal implications and federal regulations, and we have to get people healthcare and that can't be tied to our jobs. And there's, you know, there are all of these things where we just have to decide who we are as Americans. And that's a very big sort of like, okay, well shit, you know? <laughs> but I, I, I feel like the restaurants are the canary in the coal mine for a lot of real problems that our country is facing. And we have been struggling with it for a long time, which is why I think we're on the front lines of these conversations. And we have been for a long time. And have you hung up your apron for good now, like professionally? Do you do you foresee any time where you're going to want to dip your toe back in at least? I think about it every day. I don't know what that means. I've learned, I've, <laughs> I don't know much, but I know at 43 years old that I never say never. You know? <laughs> I, don't, I know I will never work. Well, again, never say never. I, you know, who knows? Uh, who knows? Oh, I don't foresee ever working in someone else's kitchen ever again. I will perpetually dream of having my own space one day and it being you know, all of the expressions of love that I have and blah, 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 you know, like, I don't, you know, at risk of being a chef with a vanity project, you know, like, I would love to find myself cooking for people. That's what I am made of. I, I miss it uh, greatly. You know, um, I miss menu planning. I miss, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine, who's a chef in New York, um, Alex, Reich and she's working on a project and she was like yeah I'm working on the menu and I was like would you please just send me the menu I just want to see what you're working on and I'm I you know I gave my all and put everything I had into this book and I'm still putting everything I have into writing and that was my intention all along and I feel so lucky and grateful and thankful but there is definitely this part of me that is uh will always want that and I don't know what that means in the greater scheme of things, but I would love to find a way to cook for people again. Sure. I'll have to say thanks for introducing me to chess pie. Uh, as a northerner, I grew up in the Boston area. It's never anything I had encountered. And now I'm down in Maryland, which is the somewhat south, depending on who you ask. But I'm sure that's one of those things you hear all the time that you've become known for, right? I mean, I, I, I've seen seem to see four versions or so on the internet of, of a, you know, a chess pie by you. And uh... I uh, fell in love with chess pie. It became like something I, I really, I'm trying to remember the first time I, I think the first time I ever made a chess pie was at Margot cafe. And whenever I was her pastry chef, and maybe it was when I was a server and I had uh, she would, she, she had, um, she had her thing on lock, you know, she would have, she had like a, a folder of desserts and you, you were, by the time I came to, on to be her pastry chef, she gave me a lot of birth, you know, she gave me a wide birth to sort of like, you know, explore and try some things. Um, but ultimately she keeps a very tight rein on like what kinds of things, at least when I was there way back in the day. And I, I see her, she's got an incredible chef de cuisine right now. Um, but he's incredible and he get, he plays around quite a lot in the kitchen. And um, when I was her, I think I saw chess pie when I was a server there. And then when I came back, I started to revisit it and she did have a recipe for buttermilk chess pie. And I, that was where I made it. And that was kind of one of the first times I made it. And it was great. It's a lovely chess pie, but I wanted something more. And that was sort of where I started playing with chess pie recipe and looking at old church cookbooks and sort of finding, you know, other chess pie recipes and playing around and figuring out my ratios. And by the time I got to Husk, I had um, several years of doing Buttermilk Road, which was my pop-up supper club. And I really, really got super invested in just trying to make that super perfect. Making my pie dough really perfect was really 
something I got super nerdy about. And um, yeah, and then by the time I got to Husk, man, I, I do feel like I nailed it. I feel like that chest, the buttermilk chest pie at Husk was, was definitely um, like a glory thing for me. I was like, I got it. <laughs> I was so excited. And it was, you know, I think one of the most beautiful things about that chess pie, the buttermilk chess pie, is I could hand it to young cooks who weren't seasoned, young bakers who weren't seasoned. I could give it to a savory line cook who was just working garmage and they could nail it. You know, they could nail it. And it it was a confidence builder and it was easily taught and it was easily communicated. And it was it was, it really was a, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. I've taken that recipe and I've made it for my customers because I, you know, I wasn't trained in pastry at all, but you know, as a personal chef, I make all my own desserts and it's like, so I had to find things that I knew would work that were not too hard for me. You know, I'm not doing anything with like 10 components on the plate. So it's like, what are a few things I can really nail? So I practiced making those and man, it's a, it's a delicious pie. And I've, I've made some tweaks. I like to, I do one with like heavily orange zest in it. And then I make like a caramelized white chocolate Szechuan peppercorn ganache for just like a little drizzle. Not that the pie needs any more sugar, but it does give it like a little something different. And then I do like a spiced uh, candied, like fried peanuts. So that's one, one of my versions. That sounds really nice. You know, my favorite version of that pie, I'll do at Christmas time and I pull out the lemon. I still do a little lemon juice just to help buoy the buttermilk a little bit, but I pull out the lemon zest and in place of it, I just put a shit ton of nutmeg and then I pour just a little bit of bourbon or rum or something. And it makes like the best like eggnoggy tasting pie ever. Sounds amazing. I love eggnog. Me too. Me too. I make eggnog in the summer and people think it's disgusting. I'm like, you drink milkshakes in the summer. How's that any different? Well, I guess so. I never made the correlation. Yeah, like a 90 degree day, just like a big old cold eggnog. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I suppose. Although it just, it kind of sets me on my heels a little bit. If I'm, being honest. I'm like, wow, that's intense. I think it's the eggs that I don't want. It's not the cream. I might beg to differ because there's so much egg and an eggnog that's different than a, maybe it's not depending on the, I mean, if you're having, yeah. I mean, isn't it like ice cream, like a, an ice cream has eggs and an ice cream has cream and you know. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Damn it. I have to think that through a little bit better. Summer egg, summer eggnogs. Let's make them happen. Kind of like a bushwhacker. Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> I, you know what? I love a bushwhacker. I love nothing more than sitting on a Pensacola beach and drinking a trashy bushwhacker at a bar. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so I always like to ask, who's uh, someone in the food industry that you love that you don't think gets enough attention? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm always quick to say Erica Council in Atlanta. She makes some of the most beautiful biscuits ever. And I've just always, I'm just such a fan of her as a human. She's like, man, she's just this, she's building this business down there of like, I swear to God, like I always thought I made pretty decent biscuits and I've been told I make really good biscuits, but I'm going to tell you something. You've not had a biscuit until, I mean, just looking at a picture of her biscuits, you're like, what is happening? Um, and she does, she does both kinds. I feel like she makes these really beautiful buttermilk biscuits that are really traditionally Southern. And then she's also perfected this angel flake biscuit that I'm obsessed with. I've never eaten it, but I've seen pictures of it and it looks like, and I mean this as a compliment, it looks like those like pop Pillsbury ones that have those unreal totally factory fabricated flakes in them, you know? Yeah. She produces these, be they're just stunning. And I love that, you know, she comes from this like long line of like family food people in Georgia and she's a mother and she's a wife and she's just out there building this business and she's been doing it slow and steady with, and with integrity. And, um, I just think she's tops. And I just think as a person, I value her so much. I, she's probably tired of me talking about her on podcasts, but I just, I think that she's the greatest, um, one of the greatest Southern bakers out there. Well, I don't know anything about her, so I appreciate you sharing that. 
Yeah, check her out. She's uh, she's got Bomb Biscuit in Atlanta, Georgia, and she is they are they are Bomb Biscuits, man. They're nuts. <laughs> and I think she's starting. I know she started to do delivery last year, and I think she's starting to do shipment. So if you're like on a national scale, I should have looked it up um, before we talked, but. I think she might be on her way if she hasn't already um, to some national shipment. And I'm really pulling for it because that's what the world deserves. <laughs> it's amazing how many people have figured that out these days. Like during the COVID times, so many more people have figured a way to ship their products. And I love it. Me too. Me too. I, I really enjoyed seeing, um, you know, Nashville's had a really great turn of um, people just being in, you know, making these cottage industry, you know, bootstrapped businesses that have just taken off, you know, I mean, there's a gentleman in Nashville making some of the most beautiful mixtamalized corn tortillas and you can buy his masa and you can, he makes, um, tamales and he's got a truck and I mean, he's just killing it. And his product is so amazing and so has so much integrity and he was working he's been working in Nashville for god I mean you know for an over for a while for a decade I've known of him and I, he he's been um you know he's been the chef at different restaurants here and there and they would like give him a once a month taco night to have and display his like super skills and then he'd go back to being a chef at you know a, a fine restaurant but like his work wasn't prominent like he wasn't doing this and then all of a sudden he was and I'm so grateful that like though the however tragic this past year has been um these little moments of people finding their space has been really beautiful to watch yeah I love it I mean not quite as many as those who've lost some businesses in the restaurant industry but there are a lot of cool things popping up like this so I, I have a lot of hope Same, same, you know, it is, it has been tragic and hard to see the toll this has taken on a lot of some of my very closest friends and some people that I just admire and respect a lot from far away. And uh, it's been brutal and it's still brutal to watch, you know, how hard this has been. So, yeah, but I, 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 I'm trying to stay in the the zone of, of hope and, um, keeping the truths real, but also like finding the moments to celebrate. Absolutely. Hey, can you recommend a book? Uh, It could be a cookbook or a non-cooking book. Sure. I mean, right now I'm obsessed. You know, George Saunders pops his head up out of like, you know, he goes goes into his working hole and, you you know, forget the magnitude of him for just a moment. And then he pops up and you're like, ah, George Saunders. <laughs> and he just came out with a book. Um, I want to get it right. Hold on, let me grab it because it's a beautiful title and I don't want to muck it up. It's called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. I think it's one of the most he just, you know, he wrote Lincoln and the Bardo probably about five years ago. Maybe that's longer ago, but maybe around five or six years ago. And it's a magnificent piece of work. Like if, if you're looking for something to just sink into the audio book of it, it's beautifully performed. Um, But he's just one of my favorite writers. He's a beautiful short story writer and he also teaches Russian literature. Um, And so this book is taking apart, I think four or six, I can't remember. I'm only halfway through it really important pieces of Russian literature. And then he like steps back after each page and he basically it's the, the course, which sounds rote and terrible maybe if you're not into that kind of thing, but he is infusing it with all of these sorts of understandings about human nature and interconnectivities. And it's, it's basically a conversation about, I don't know, just human beings. And he's doing it through the lens of literature. It's beautiful. It's it's a beautiful book. He's, I think, one of the most important voices out there right now in his, uh, you know, he's he's very much a scholar of like Buddhism. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm starting to sort of seek out some things as I'm approaching middle age that help me navigate some things. And his voice is uh, really seminal in what I hope to accomplish with my own person, which is a sense of, retaining that sense of awe 
while also being a pragmatist who likes to solve problems, <laughs> which gets harder as you get older. So he's, you know, this is a really great example of that. <laughs> oh, and I also just read The Practice by Seth Godin, who's one of my favorites. Do you know Seth Godin? I feel like I've seen the name. He's written like 27 books. One of the things he's well known for is he's written a blog post every day for something like 20 years, like as long as the internet's been around. But it's it's around business and creativity. So the practice is about shipping your work, like getting the work done. And he writes a lot about, you know, like people who are creatives and create things and the idea that like, you know, identifying that you make things for a certain person and being okay with like that they're not for everyone. You know, his slogan is like, I make this for people like this. You are not people like this. And that's okay. Yeah. It's like I tell my, you know, I, my, of course, like both of my kids in their teenage years in the social media era, like struggled with, I think, you know, feeling like everyone had to be their friend. And I'm like, no, it's, that's actually if everyone is like, that's, that doesn't work. <laughs> like the fact that you have two or three really good friends is actually a strength is actually a really good thing. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's so much of like, um, before the pandemic hit my, my thinking about who this book was going to potentially reach was far broader than it actually ended up being. And there has been so much beauty in sort of recognizing that, like, this is, these are the people that needed to hear this. I wasn't really anticipating so much open dialogue with women my mother's age. Like, I really wasn't. And there was kind of a moment where I was like, have I done, I mean, if I'm being really frank, where I'm like, no, nobody my age seems to be getting anything out of like, you know, like having these moments of like, did I reach the audience I meant to reach? Well, it doesn't matter. Like that is the audience that really is, this is resonating with. And it's starting to bleed into the other categories that I sort of suspected might also come to it. But that's an important thing to recognize if you're a maker of any sort, like, just acknowledging your audience and saying, okay, like, this is who I'm talking to, I guess. Yeah, the same with the same with my podcast. It's, you know, like, I'm just at the point where I want to make the show that I want to make and people are going to come and I found that the people who are listening to it aren't necessarily the people I thought were going to be listening to it, but people are listening to it. And that's great. And, you know, at first, I was disappointed when someone I know said, yeah, I listen to the podcast. It's not really for me. And you're like, shit, this is who I made the podcast for. You know, you own a food truck. You're not, you're not listening to this. And then I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm making the show I want to make. But people are listening, so I'm doing something right. But it's not necessarily the people I thought it would be. Yeah, it's interesting. And, it, you know, there. I feel like there's very many different conversations about – being a woman in this world. And I think in my, by the back of my mind, I thought I was having a, a, a conversation that was more angled towards sort of a younger generation. But there, I think they've, you know, people that are 10 years younger than me have, this is probably like workbook shit for them. You know, like, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> And I'm, and I think women of a certain age and older have been dying to hear these words, you know. And so, uh, I again, I, I I can say I wasn't really thinking about an audience at all because I don't know that this book would have come out if I had been. But I do, I will ignore, I will accept. Like I was a little surprised at how invisible it became to this demographic and wholly visible to this demographic it was so that was an interesting sort of like oh okay like not what I expected was not disappointed but like just not what I expected you know I, I took a podcasting class and I said create an avatar of your listener and make sure it is not you like how old is your listener what gender are they what's their story like th they say go f so far as to like find a picture of a random person on the internet who you think would look like your listener and like tape it to your wall with like what's their name what's their job and they said like but it's okay if they look like you but like realize that it might not be you it might not you know to chris and shazo at restaurants it might not be a 40 year old white guy who lives in the mid Atlantic who's been in food forever, it might really be a 22 year old African American woman who lives in LA or, you know, whatever that just, just, you can't always put yourself out there thinking that you're going to be your target listener. And I think that gets really hard no matter what um, creative space you're in. 
Yeah. Well, it kind of just, you know, it, it reminds me to make the work despite, you know, despite an audience, I think, you know, I mean, I really believe in if you are a creative person, like making the work and kind of like what we're saying, it, you know, it will resonate somewhere because I think anybody that takes any time making anything that is of their the deepest parts of their humanity it's going to get recognized by someone else's deepest part of their humanity and I think that's the why you know it's I value creative makers and artists in this world you know and I think it's so important to do that so you know I I I try to sort of you know think about my intentions and what I need in this world and then make that you know, communicate those things. And I'm, I'm lucky I get to, you know, I'm married to a sculptor and, and we get to have these probably really pretentious, heady conversations about the value of art and making in this world. But I really am committed to that. I'm really glad. I'm really grateful to find myself in a place where I can say that and honestly try to, you know, try to build my life around it. Well, I look forward to seeing whatever your next venture is. Hopefully you're going to take a little time, I'm sure, before like the next big thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, uh, I'm incubating right now. <laughs> I, you know, my husband, uh, John, is uh, good at reminding me that I, it's, a, it's a marathon, you know, and, um, and that you know, and then I, I look to George Saunders too, and the moments he disappears from culture entirely to to really kind of find the thing that is worth uh, putting out in the world, and trying to have that patience in a world where everything is immediate and constant is hard. Um, but I think it's worth fighting for, and I hope I can pay my bills between now and the next thing. <laughs> Uh, so that I don't get my, uh, you know, my industrial worker bee doesn't freak out too much. Um, that's been the hardest part for me is, you know, not clamoring to make sure every financial detail is addressed. And, um, you know, I have worked since I was 15 years old. And so changing my idea of what work is, is a hard one for me. But I can recognize at this age and at this point in my life that it's really important to my craft, not to sound too much like a pretentious piece of shit, but like to honor the work like that I've worked hard to be able to do means I've got to stop panicking and stop calling, you know, people to write menus and do catering and do, you know, sell pies and sell cakes. I've got to I've got to stop engaging in that part of my person, which is hard for me. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on some things. I'm trying to build some things and I, um, that I really believe in and I'm, I think I'll get to do them. Knock on wood. I can't wait. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been great. I've loved having you. I've enjoyed every second talking to you. Thanks for asking me to come on. And next time you have something new, I would love to catch up with you again about it. Great. I would love to do it. Awesome. Well, thanks to all our listeners. This has been Chris with the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. As always, you can find us at chefswithoutrestaurants.org and .com and on all social media platforms. Thanks so much and have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show, please let us know. We can be reached at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.